I'm very concerned about how we're going to readjust when things, you know, go back to how they were or the new normal, whatever that's going to be. I don't think we've paid enough attention to how difficult that might be for people. There could be a mental health crisis under the radar of this and or there could be a spiritual revolution. And actually, you know, there are bits of both. So Tara, welcome back to the podcast. It's so lovely to be connected with you, although remotely. Um, after having, you know, you were the first podcast that I did when my book came out. And um, yeah, it's bringing back lots of memories. And it's just the world, whole world is different now, right? Yeah, it really is. And I, I knew, I always knew we'd do a part two at some point. I, I was hoping we'd be face to face again. But clearly, um, the, the current world situation is not allowing us to do that. So we're going to have to use technology for one of its amazing, um, you know, one of its amazing roles, which is it can help us connect, right? So we're able to have this conversation, Tara, and I remember our conversation really well, not only because I loved it, but I remember my audience absolutely loved the content in our conversation. Um, so if people are watching this on YouTube or they're listening, if you haven't heard the first conversation I had with Tara, I would highly, highly recommend it. But I know on the back of that, Tara, lots of my audience actually bought your book, The Source, and I still get messages about how much people find it useful and are applying a lot of the techniques in there. So thank you very much for agreeing to come back on the show. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, it's interesting you should say that because I've had a lot of messages from people saying they're rereading it now, which which kind of makes sense, you know, and, and to some extent, I think if I hadn't written those things down and actually, you know, have it in a book that I can pick up if I need to, I might be struggling a bit now, you know, I mean, there are definitely lots of things in there that are very helpful at the moment. Yeah, for sure. And actually, you know, there's a few things we, we did cover last time. I think we are going to try and move the conversation on, but I do think it's worth, you know, I do, I do think it's worth retouching on some of them because I think they have a different relevance in the current pandemic and the way many of us are feeling. But let me tell you about one thing I have found really, really useful. Um, I find it useful anyway, but particularly in the pandemic, I found very useful. It's something you spoke about last time and you've written about, and that's journaling. So I also have written about journaling. I think it's so, so powerful. I think I've heard you say before somewhere that it's one of the most powerful and most impactful things that you do on a regular basis. So I... I mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk about journaling, why it's so useful, why you find it useful, and actually why in the pandemic it might be a brilliant time to start if you don't already do so. That's such a good point. So I remember last time the point of difference that you liked about how I spoke about journaling was that it's not just about downloading your thoughts and your emotions, although there's a lot of benefit to doing that to get them off your mind and you know to reduce your stress levels. But it's about reading back over and charting your sort of emotional journey or your personal development. So everything seems like it's two sides of the coin at the moment. It could be that, you know, you're downloading a lot of negative emotions, conflicts at home, you know, difficult times, but also it's an opportunity to evolve as a person. Um, so, so now is a really good time to do it because it's helpful to just download, but when you look over it, it can help make a lot of sense of things. So um, one of the models that I'm using at the moment that's really helpful and, and it should, would come up in journaling is, it's an old 1960s psychological model. It's actually related to grief. It's known as the Kubler-Ross grief curve. And it was later remodeled as the change curve, and it's used in management and business. And it's, it's basically about any unexpected change, shock, grief um, that happens to you that you, you know, you didn't, you didn't choose, you didn't want it to come into your life. So, you know, very relevant now. The emotional journey that we go on as a result of that. And it talks us through shock, denial, anger, depression, and then some sort of finding meaning and purpose in it and moving towards acceptance. Now, using a model like that for journaling could, could be really, really helpful right now. Um, I'm particularly finding that people who are you know, confined in a household, it's so obvious that we don't move through that curve at the same rate necessarily. So you know, if you're having a down day, if you're feeling like things are really getting on top of you and it's really, you know, 
at the front of your mind that we don't know how long this is going to go on for, but your wife is in a different part of the curve, that can sort of create some kind of tension in, in, the, in the family. And so understanding that, and journaling is a great way to do that, to surface that, um, is, is really helpful because it's likely at the moment we'll go through that curve several times as restrictions get eased, maybe, you know, as things change, maybe they go backwards. And each time we can use that model or just our journaling, you know, what we read in our own journal to understand where we are emotionally. Now, I love that explanation. And one thing I have found myself, but also a lot of people have fed back to me, is that, you know, when you journal, often things come out that you didn't even know were there. So you have these anxieties and these worries that are, that are whirling around your mind. And if you don't have a way to process them, they stay there and they can impact how you feel that day, your stress levels, your relationship, whether you snap at your kids, whether you snap at your partner. And I find that journaling each morning, you know, for me, it's something that, you know, I get up before everyone else in my house. It's something I, I've always liked to do. And, you know, I do a bit of a morning routine, but sometimes I'll be sitting there with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or a hot drink with a journal and I'll just write whatever comes down. I quite like free form journaling. So with no set questions I have to answer. I know some people like questions and that's completely fine. But for me, I like free form journaling. And I think, oh, oh, that, that obviously was on your mind. You didn't quite realize it was on your mind. So I think journaling is incredibly useful. But I think the other thing you mentioned there is really, really key. And that's, well, there was quite a few things you mentioned. One of them is that different people in the same household can be feeling differently about the same problem mm -hmm. and therefore unless we understand that this can cause disharmony this can cause fights between partners mm -hmm. you know parents and children and so yes having an understanding of that's important but what can we actually do about that yeah so that's where journaling really comes in because if you write down how you're feeling like I know you like to do that morning pages then you know just that free form how I'm feeling then when you can reflect afterwards about why maybe a conflict occurred or why you felt like somebody wasn't on the same page as you or they got snappy with you or you got snappy with them, you can start to equate, whether it's a physical feeling, whether it's just the mood that you wake up in in the morning, to a certain emotional state. And then if it happens again, you can recognize it maybe a bit earlier and maybe not go as far as snapping. You know, you might say, I'm having a bad day. Um, I'm feeling the same as I did, you know, three weeks ago when X happened, but you might find some strategies to not snap. So, you know, you may go for a walk. Um, you, you can, it can help you make the decision between, is it the right day to go for a family bike ride or do you need a bit of time to yourself, for example? That, that, that is so key, isn't it? Because let's talk about parents. You know, we are both parents. We have children in the house with us during this period. And it's something that can pose some challenges. There can be some wonderful benefits of that, but mm -hmm. there can also be, you know, a, a bit less time to ourselves. And, and I've noticed this with my wife a little bit, like sometimes we will go all out together, the four of us on a bike mm -hmm. ride or a walk, where sometimes she'll want me to take the kids so that she can go for a mm -hmm. walk herself. And mm -hmm. I guess what we're fundamentally talking about is awareness, an awareness of how we're feeling and an awareness of what we need. And, you know, I don't know what you think of this, Tara, but I think unless you have some degree of solitude in your day, some time to reflect in some way, whether that's journaling or sitting in the garden staring at the birds, I think it's very hard to actually know what's going on in your own body and your own mind. I think it's so interesting that you've picked that up because most people are, you know, the narrative is I don't have as much connection as I normally do. You know, some people might be completely on their own or it might, you know, they might be just a couple. So it's interesting you said we've both got children, but, you know, I'm a step parent and mine, mine's an adult. And so we're not actually together. So that's a separate concern. You know, somebody's on their own. And are they lonely? What's happening to their mental health? Um, so my husband and I find ourselves alone together for the first time since we've you know, been married. Um, and it's very easy to focus on not being connected to many friends or other members of the family. 
But it's very interesting how I actually find I really need time to myself, even though I'm only with one other person. Um, and I think people get into a routine. We sort of naturally, we have all our meals together, but in between that, he goes to a study, I, I work from here. And then at five or six o'clock, we come together to do some exercise. And then it's cook dinner and, you know, watch, watch something on the TV, basically. So we've got a little routine like that. And one of my friends, because she is homeschooling, and working. Um, I said to her, you know, I've just got a husband to look after. You've got a husband, a son, a dog and two cats. And she <laughs> said, the other day, all of us were sitting on the couch together. And she said, the more time we spend together, the more we want to be together. So, you know, there are so many different experiences of, of what we're all going through now. Yeah. And I think it's one of those things that possibly isn't getting spoken about enough, maybe because we feel insensitive talking about the possible upsides of lockdown. But I think, I think it's okay to do that. I think we can recognize on one hand, yes, this is hard. Some people are having their businesses ruined, economic hardship, they're gonna lose their jobs, they're being more anxious, mental health problems. Some people are obviously getting hospitalized. Um, you know, people are having loved ones die. You know, I get it on one hand, mm. clearly a lot of negatives, but there's always positives that we can take from negative experiences. And it's something I guess we touched upon on, the, on our first conversation about how, you know, your divorce, uh, my experience of my bereavement, well, my, my father dying and how that impacted mm. me has actually caused a lot of changes and a lot of positive changes in our lives on the back of that. So, you know, I think it's okay to say, yeah, it, it's it's a hard time. But actually, you know, on a personal level, I've got to say, there have been many positives. Mm. I have never spent this much time with my kids and my wife on a consistent basis, yeah. you know. And you know what? I realized I love being around them. Like I knew that yeah. anyway, but I love it even more. And I think, well, yeah. what would life look like if I saw them this much all the time? Can I... Um, can I sort of start to create a life which actually puts that at the heart of it? Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I, you know, I already said there's two sides to every coin. And so you're absolutely right. You know, there's, there's grief, there's, there's mental health um, adjustment issues. And, you know, I'm very concerned about how we're going to readjust when things, you know, go back to how they were or the new normal, whatever that's going to be. I don't think we've paid enough attention to how, difficult that might be for people. But but you're absolutely right. There are, you know, there's so many positives. And I've coined a phrase that, you know, that this there could be a mental health crisis under the radar of this. And or there could be a spiritual revolution. And actually, you know, there are bits of both. So I've definitely had my ups and downs, but I'm, I've got such a strong focus on my personal development now, what I'm reading, I'm doing an online course, I'm getting coaching. Um, and it's, you know, in, in that respect, I think it's a wonderful way to look at who you really are. It reminds me of John Kabat-Zinn's phrase, wherever you go, there you are. Well, at the moment, there you are all the time, 24 seven, you know, you can't get away from yourself. And so what I've really seen, and I'd love to hear what, what you've noticed in this respect is, after I got divorced, that's when, you know, at rock bottom, I had a huge realization about my level of determination, that it was very, very strong. And I'd never had a reason to really notice it before, but you know, when I had to, that's what I noticed. And now that you know, you can't have people coming into the house if you know something breaks, like the fridge or the boiler or or an electrical switch. All examples of things that I've had to deal with in the last few weeks or months. And normally, where you just pick up the phone and get somebody else to deal with it, now I'm like, can I change an electrical switch? Or you know, sort of the fridge drawer broke I asked my husband to do it and he said there's something wrong with it it's impossible and so I said oh I'll have another go and you know and I kept at it till I did it and it sort of reminded me that that determination that I discovered at the worst time of my life is really playing out now and I think it's so interesting to think what's coming to the fore now good and bad you know because there are things that I'm seeing about myself that I hadn't noticed before that people would call shadow work you know some of these emotions that come up when you're under stress they're more obvious now than they might be at normal times. So, but I'm taking that as an opportunity to work on those things. And I'm reminding myself, you know, you're, you're so determined, like what can you get done kind of thing? And that's a really good feeling. So it's fine to have both, like you say. 
Yeah, I, I guess it's really hammering home that theme of awareness, isn't it? You, you, you're aware of some of these positive qualities and you're choosing to put your attention on them. You're choosing to actually feed your brain that information that, hey, look, I, I, I am determined. I am resourceful. And that really, you know, that really plays into, you know, a lot of the themes that you write about, you talk about, and how powerful our thoughts are and how how important it is that we intentionally put our focus on particular areas. You know, why focus on the negatives? Why not spend our time focusing on the positives? And then that's what we become. And, you know, hearing that, it's it made me think, you know, this is trivial, right? This is so trivial. But, you know, I like many busy people. I say busy in inverted commas because I think busyness is a trap that many of us fall into mm-hmm. in the modern world. But a simple thing like, I don't know, like I've cycled a lot more in the last six or seven weeks than ever, frankly, for years. Like every day I'm taking the kids on a bike ride somewhere. It's it's brilliant. Yeah. And I realized that I would occasionally get my bike or their bike serviced. Like I would take it in. There's nothing wrong with that. But one of their brakes wasn't working the other day. And it was an issue. And I thought, well, everything's shut. I thought, well, come on, you can do this. And, you know, yeah. I, I spent a bit of time figuring it out, getting the toolkit out, and I fixed it. And I know it sounds so small, but you know what? I had such, it felt so good. I thought, oh, I'm I'm able to do that. It was just a small thing. But, it, yeah, it really made me feel good. Yeah, it is. it's it is. I totally get it. Because when I had to phone up the electrical company about this switch, I was you know, I described the problem. He said, it sounds like it's a switch, you know, the switch needs to be changed. And I was like, could I do it? And he said, well, you know, it's like for like, if you open it up and you see where it is and you change the part, you just, you know, put it back to how it was. And I said, I am a scientist. I think I could do it. You know, and it's, um, it, I've been doing um, in this personal development work, sort of revisiting some of my childhood, like who were you before, you know, sort of school and parental expectation and stuff, you know, molded you into the adult that you became. And one of the first things I ever said, apparently, was when, um, you know, I was, I was so small that at the age that your parents still brushed your teeth, apparently, I used to often say, I do it, I do it. And that's definitely coming up again now. I'm feeling just so like, you know, if the brakes failed on my back, yeah, I definitely would have a go. And, and I know it would make me feel so good, even though it seems like a small thing. Yeah, let's be, let's be aware that there's be some people listening to this now who'll go, look, okay, I've never been as stressed as I am right now. I've got my kids at home, I'm trying to work, or I'm an intensive care nurse and I'm doing shifts and then I come back and my children are at home and I'm knackered. And I see on Instagram that people are learning Chinese. I just want to be able to get through the day. So for someone like that, who doesn't feel that they've got time, you know, what would you say to them that they might want to focus on during this period? Mm-hmm. Um, I've actually so I, I read a, a headline that JK Rowling has had come out and said you know all those life coaches who, who are saying this is the time to learn Chinese or you know build your new brand should stop shaming people and the neuroscience really supports that 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 is the case that I think you know I'm talking about embedding micro habits I'm not saying learn a new language or you know sort of um do lots of things and I completely understand what you're saying there are some people that are just under so much pressure and they can't make time for themselves and they you know don't necessarily want to do lots of new things because they don't have the bandwidth in their brain so I think really the answer is be kind to yourself even if it's just having a bath you know maybe with some magnesium salts um because people who are stressed have high levels of circulating cortisol the stress hormone there's a systemic dryness, you know, we've got dry skin, dry hair, there might be issues with, um, you know, bowel movements and things. So it's just paying attention to drinking more water. Um, you know, I've got clients at the moment with kidney stones because they're, you know, so busy trying to fit everything in, they're not drinking enough water. So I think, like I said, embedding micro habits, doing those small things that, you know, in your busy life, you say, oh, I wish I could get into the habit of exercising, taking supplements but you don't do it, well, now try to focus on those small things that will actually make your brain and your body more able to cope with the stress that you're going through. So I love that advice. And, you know, it just so aligns with what I also stand for. I think micro habits are very much undervalued. 
um, you know, I've, I've been speaking about for the whole year, five minute interventions yeah. and how five minutes can make a huge difference. And we all have five minutes, right? We all have five minutes. If we look at, if we, if we analyze our day and what we've spent time doing, I would, I would challenge most people to say they don't have five minutes in the day for a bit of self-care, you know, mm. and it could be anything. It could be five minutes of journaling first thing in the morning. It mm. could be last thing at night. It could be just before you have your lunch or your dinner, you do a quick five minute workout, even less than five minutes, right? I, I tried to buy some kettlebells, I think two weeks into lockdown. And frankly, I couldn't find a single one in the entire UK, like nothing. So I imagine that pretty much every household in the UK at the moment has got some form of home exercise equipment. Now, I don't think you need home exercise equipment, but if you've got a dumbbell or a kettlebell, right? It's like, put it in your kitchen or put it in your bedroom so you're always being visually triggered by it. Mm -hmm. And even if once a day you pick it up and do five bicep curls on each arm, if that's all you do, that is still self-care. That is still sending a signal to your body saying, you know what, I prioritize myself. I'm a strong human being that's thriving. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we really shouldn't undervalue the value and and just how impactful these small micro habits are, especially when you do them consistently. Yeah, I love your, you know, five minutes a day. And, you know, there are like, a, there's 30 or more tips in your book, isn't there? Yeah. Things that you can do for five minutes. Um, my one is I once, um, so I keep my yoga mat out in my bedroom because it's that trigger, you know, so you sort yeah. of feel a little bit. Um, a yoga teacher once said to me when I asked, how do you, get into the habit of a daily practice so you don't always have 90 minutes or an hour or even half an hour necessarily and she said if you leave your yoga mat out even if you just lie on it for five minutes that's a daily practice if you can do 90 minutes the next day or you know an hour or whatever that's more of your practice but even if you just lie on your mat for five minutes then you've done you've connected with your yoga mat every day and last time we talked about self-love which I think is more important than ever now. And I think even just lying on that mat is telling yourself, I care for myself, I love myself, I'm taking this time because me being well and whole is important. Oh, my Tara, it, it's so amazing to hear you say this. And I just want to, for people listening to this now, just let me just re-emphasize, Tara is um, a medical doctor, psychiatrist, health coach, neuroscientist, lecturer at MIT, executive coach. You know, I, I could list that off. The, the point I'm trying to make is with all your specialist qualification in a number of different fields, you're still saying even five minutes a day of lying on a yoga mat has value. And I really yeah. want people listening to this to really, really absorb that and go, it really makes a difference. So I just want to add to that and say, and, and, you know, a lot of um, BJ Fogg, Professor BJ Fogg's work uh, from Stanford on behavior change talks about the importance of tiny habits. Um, and, and really even the point where even if you do one minute, you're still engaging in that. You're still going through the process of creating that habit. Like if you make mm. one or two minutes or even five minutes your goal, if you, do, if you do one or two minutes, you get your tick. Some days you'll do 10 minutes. Some days you'll do 20 minutes. But on your bad day, still lie on the mat, still do your two minutes or your five minutes. And it takes the pressure off. And I also like what he talks about, you've said this before, about how emotion also helps us um, create these habits of positive emotion, right? So do you do, do you, with your clients, with your, um, with the people you coach, do you talk to them about how to create those positive emotions after they've engaged in a habit? Yeah, so the way that the word that I use, but we're talking about the same thing, is intention. So it's your intention or desire to do something does make a difference to how li likely you are to do it. And then the enjoyment of it also has a different effect on your brain of producing endorphins that make you, you know, they create a sort of motivational pathway where you want to do that activity more. So basically, choosing something that you enjoy or is really meaningful to you. You know, for me, that story of even if you lie on your mat for five minutes, your yoga mat for five minutes, 
in my mind, that's become associated with self-care and self-love. So it means a lot more to me than just lying on my mat for five minutes. And so each person needs to find that thing for themselves because when the intention is that positive and meaningful, you're both more likely to do it and more likely to get more benefit out of it for your brain and your body. Yeah. So, you know, for example, what I said about the cortisol, which I agree with you, there are lots of positives to, you know, sort of not being as busy as we were, not traveling, you know, having more time at home, having more time with your loved ones. But it's still the case that there's this surreal background of something's wrong. You know, that is there, that background anxiety. Um, and so doing these things that can also reduce your stress levels. So, you know, taking a bath, lying on your yoga mat, doing yoga, whatever it is for you that you know is the thing that reduces your stress. I mean, my one is that it's a, you know, a bath with the magnesium salts in because yeah. magnesium, you know, it sort of reduces levels of the stress hormone. So if I, if, you know, if I'm having a really bad day, I'll just go straight up to the bath. Um, and, you know, keeping on top of things like ordering your magnesium salts from Amazon or whatever, so that you, they're always there. Um, I just, you know, it's just triggered me to remember I'm about to run out. So even that's an act of self-care, remembering to top up the stuff that you need to keep you going when, when you're not having a good day, but then absolutely focusing on, on the good days. I mean, you know, I had a very interesting reflection a couple of weeks ago where I guess I was probably quite grumpy, but I, you know, wasn't that aware of it. But then I woke up one day and I just felt so much more positive and I thought, oh, Okay, I had two days where I was not really, you know, feeling that great. What can I learn from it? You know, how can I make sure it doesn't last as long next time? Um, so I have this really nice practice that I'm doing in the morning now, which is as soon as I wake up, because as you know, um, I used to do my meditation on the tube. Well, that's, yeah. you know, I'm not doing that now. So I do it as soon as I wake up, otherwise I find that I don't do it. Um, that's quite, that's a tip I've been helping my clients with saying, if something's important to you, for your self-care, do it first thing in the morning. Because um, there's so many distractions now, we're working and we're managing the household and you know those things can get mixed up. So I ask myself a question, whatever I'm working on at the moment, and I ask it to my brain for a logical answer. And then I do some deep breathing and then I place my hands on my heart and I ask it to my heart for an emotional answer. And then I do some deep breathing, I place my hands on my belly and I ask the same question for an intuitive answer. Um, and that's something I've written about in the book, um, called, which I've called Harmony, which is that you're aligned in your head, your heart and your gut. Um, and it's, it's fascinating how you get answers. Like you said in your, in your journaling, you sometimes write something that you, were, you weren't aware of, that you didn't expect. You get answers that were not at the front of your mind if you push it deeper and deeper. So that's something I've been doing with, with some of my clients as well. Tara, that's such a beautiful such a beautiful image comes with my mind of that how you just align everything and you ask different parts of you for the answer rather than most of us often it's just this kind of you know the brain or the emotional brain that's kind of determining what we do and we don't sort of take time to tap into other parts of us to actually tell us and help us to determine what's going on I really really like that um you mentioned before that one of one of the things you predict is that we may either have a mental health crisis on the back of this or a spiritual revolution, or more likely a bit of both. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd love to sort of delve into this a little bit. So when you say spiritual revolution, I think it's probably worth defining what do you mean by the word spirituality? And then we can perhaps go a bit deeper and go, why does the current pandemic lead you to believe that many people might start to access this idea in themselves because I agree I absolutely agree many people are questioning life and where they fit into society and what's their role mm -hmm. right so perhaps you could start by just defining what do you mean when you say spirituality so that's I, I don't know whether to answer that or to, to, to put, sort of put it back to your listeners and say, you know, what it means to you. But the way that I, you know, have described it in the past is that things, everything in life can be broken, can be, you know, sort of put into a grid of physical, mental, emotional and spiritual. So physical is obviously what's going on in your body. And um, 
I talk about something that you'll know about, but I just feel that not many people do, which is our, our sense, you could call it our sixth sense, which is interoception, which is the understanding of the physiological state of the inside of your body. So, you know, your breathing, your digestion, um, the, the, you know, the dryness of your skin, that kind of thing. So what's going on in your body? What Mental is what's going on in your thoughts and emotional is what's going on in your feelings. So sometimes people say, what's the difference between those two? But, you know, thoughts are the, kind, the nature of the thoughts you're having. Are they negative? Are they positive? Um, how many thoughts you're having? Do you feel quite blank or do you feel like, you know, there's a million thoughts rushing around your head? And then the emotions are, do you feel sad? Do you feel angry? Do you feel frightened? Do you feel happy? Do you feel, um, you know, trust or love and, you know, the people that you're with or in the process of what's going to happen? Um, and then spiritual is really something that's not explained by those three things. And it's something that you feel in your spirit or your integrity or your values. But I would have to say that during this pandemic, I would add something to that, which is, I, I did mention it in the book, but I think I wasn't brave enough to go down that spiritual path too much because, you know, I felt that it was about the backing of the science, which is something I've called universal connection. So it's either the understanding that we're connected to each other in ways that we either didn't understand before or have chosen not to really acknowledge. And also that there's, you know, there's some greater force that we're, we're also connected to. So whether you call it a universal consciousness, um, Carl Jung, the psychologist, talked about the collective unconscious. And that's certainly um, showing up now in the phenomenon of vivid dreaming. Have you been experiencing vivid dreams? You know what I think? I might have done on a day or two, but not really. Um, I think my wife has. I think my kids certainly have. And I know many people out there have been. And, and you did a, a really fascinating Instagram post on this, didn't you, about vivid dreaming? Yeah, it's because I had had a vivid dream. And it was, it was a strange story. I basically, so what's happening is that because we're, you know, we're in uncertainty, there's usually an anxiety element to these dreams and, and that makes people think that it's bad, but actually it's very healthy emotional processing that our brains are doing. Um, so, you know, I thought I was absolutely fine until I had this anxiety dream and I was like, okay, you know, obviously there's some background anxiety and that's, that's, that's normal. That's fine. So it's basically in a scary place and, um, you know, couldn't get out. And suddenly one of my former coaching clients from years ago appeared in front of me. And I was so relieved to see him that I, you know, ran forward and gave him a hug. And then he took me by the hand and he rescued me from this place. But as soon as we got outside, I said to him, but I hugged you and you held my hand and now I'm going to get COVID. And then I woke up thinking like, what a strange dream. So I came downstairs and I said to my husband, I had this strange dream and this guy was in it. And he, you know, he knows the guy. So I mentioned him by name. And then, as I said, we had breakfast and then he went to a study and I was working and I get a text message and it's from the guy that was in the dream the night before. I mean, no word of a lie. I checked. He hadn't texted me for three months and he was just checking in. How are you? And I went around to my husband's study and I said, you are not going to believe who I've just had a text message from. <laughs> and he said, I, I can't imagine. Um, and I said, you know, if I hadn't told you about the dream, if I came to you now and said, I got a text message from this guy and he was in my dream last night, you would have just written that off. But the fact that I had told him. And then it happened. I know that's a total anecdote, but it just made me look into this collective unconscious and vivid dreaming. And it turns out that it's a phenomenon that occurred during both the world wars and the Holocaust. So, you know, again, that's when all of the, the whole world was involved in something that affected them. Doesn't matter who you are, where you are, you're being affected by this global situation um, in a, you know, a way that's anxiety inducing. Um, and then, um, I looked into it a bit more. I used to live and work in Australia. So, you know, I know quite a lot about the Aboriginal dream time. And, you know, that's the concept of the story of creativity and, and our connectedness to everything and everyone. And I started thinking, well, there's, you know, there's definitely something here. And then two completely different sets of journalists contacted me to ask um, for, you know, some sort of neuroscience quotes on vivid, the vivid dreaming phenomenon. And and I got quite a lot of responses to that IGTV, people saying that it's a thing in African culture, Asian cultures. Um, 
So it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't explain it. And I guess that's what spirituality means to me. Something that you feel to be true and important, but you can't necessarily explain. I think that's so lovely the way you put that. A um, couple of things just to pick up on. The first one is, I, I just want to share that. I think one of the reasons I don't dream that much at the moment is, I think it's to do with caffeine. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So I've, you know... I'm pretty okay with my caffeine consumption at the moment, but I've definitely had an up and down relationship with caffeine. It's it's typically my crutch these days for the past years. When when the pressure goes up, when I've got deadlines, I, I tend to drink a bit more coffee than I know is good for me. You know, I know I thrive when I'm when I'm drinking less. And I have gone through periods of time where I've completely quit. Um and I often find when I've done that, after you get over the withdrawal symptoms, sleep is better. And I think I dream more. I, th- I really do think I dream more when I'm not on caffeine. So that's just something that I'm going to explore a little bit over the next few weeks and months. You know, I'm not, you know, one thing that has changed in me is that a couple of years ago, if I said that to you, Tara, I'd probably, I'd probably be beating myself up a bit about it. Oh, Rongan, how have you got back into that coffee habit again? You know, you shouldn't have done that. But that's not the way I look at it now. It's like, oh, okay, you know, I've chosen to do that to help me. A part of me certainly enjoys that coffee ritual in the morning. um, And I'm okay with it. You know, I really feel my relationship with it has changed. And I think, you know, at some point in the next few weeks and months, I'll probably knock it on its head again and experiment a little bit without it. But I think that's one thing for me anyway. Um, The other thing you mentioned there, which really really struck me is this idea that when you wrote the book, you probably backed out a bit, you know, you thought, you know, I'm a neuroscientist, I'm a a psychiatrist, you know, I can't be writing about this kind of stuff. And I know that feeling. I I know early on in my career, um, you know, being on TV or uh, being in the public limelight, you know, I'd be very cautious about what I said and how I said, you know, what are people going to think? But I think as I've got more secure in myself over the past years and more comfortable with who I am, I'm less afraid anymore to talk about these things because I think they're important. Mm. And I and I think most people, if they really tap in, like, you know, for some people, you'll, you'll really experience it. If you're out for a run or walk in nature, right, and you look at the trees and the and the, the water and the birds, you know, it is pretty wondrous to look at that. It, and it's hard to actually think, wow, we are living in an absolutely beautiful world. How is this all being created? You know, what is going on here? And and I, I absolutely do find, as I'm getting older, uh, and as I do more work on myself, I think I'm becoming a lot more spiritual. And I really do believe in this kind of force and, and energy that connects all of us. But even if we want to, t- you know, come out of the kind of intuition and what we're feeling, even if we use mm-hmm. our prefrontal cortex, our rational brain to try and explain this, which I know you were saying, maybe spirituality are things that we we can't explain. We know, you know, what, what we know that we are all connected because we're all going through this pandemic together. Um, yes. You know, we're all connected in the sense that we, it doesn't matter who you are, you also may be exposed, right? You're Because yes. we are all connected. How another country acts... Uh, how we act impacts our, the countries around us. You know, it's we can't all be reductionists and individual and live um, live in a way that's good for us, that our income, our house, how we're doing. And I think, for me, one of the most beautiful things about the pandemic, and again, I, I feel when I say that, I have to immediately defend myself and say, yeah, you know, and, and again, maybe that's an issue I've got in my head, but I feel I need to I had to minimize it and go, hold on a minute, you know, I'm not at all um, minimizing the negative impact on some people. No. But I do think many of us are feeling that collective consciousness and the idea that, hey, you know what, we are all connected. We're connected to our family, we're connected to our local communities, maybe our local farmers. Um, mm. it, we, it, it very much changes the narrative, not only around health, but I think around society as well. Yeah, I think it's very interesting who we're connected to now. So there's an exercise in the book called the people tree, where which is it's based on the idea of social contagion. So that, you know, you're sort of the sum of the people that you spend the most time with kind of idea. So I sort of say, draw, you know, a tree with five branches, 
put the names of the five people that you spend most time with or influence you the most and then write down five words about each of those people and then look at the 25 words and see like how much of that is reflected in you but I what I think is a really interesting twist on that now is now that you know you may be isolating with you know certain people but who are you keeping in touch with now that you don't you didn't actually used to see that much when you lived your normal life um who are you not speaking to that you actually used to spend a lot of time with I think you know there are some really interesting reflections here and I mean for me I you know I was trying to go on a sabbatical that wasn't really working um so when lockdown started I had actually two or three weeks where I sort of finally got that sabbatical and then you know the need for mental health work became so critical that I, I felt you know that I had to to respond to that because you know I can be helpful through through what I you know say and do um so that feels good but when we were on holiday in January I read the untethered soul and basically at the end of that they say if you found out that you had a week to live or a year to live what would you do and I had the answer in my my answer in my head. And I said to my husband, what would you do? And he said, I'd immediately stop working or going to meetings and I'd just spend all my time with you. Well, hello, <laughs> that's what's happening now. Um, I mean, you know, we are both working from home, but we work for ourselves, so it's pretty flexible. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's really interesting to think that the things that are actually important to us, the people that are actually important to us, we don't attend to those things because we're on this rat race of work and travel. And um, so, so I do, you know, I agree with you that there is a beauty to be found in this confinement and restriction. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, what's, what's very inspiring at the moment is, is quotes from the likes of Victor Frankl and Nelson Mandela about, you know, confinement. And I know you did that amazing podcast that got broadcast to all the prisons um, you know, perhaps we're connected to prisoners in a way that we never were before because we finally understand what confinement really is. There's, yeah. there's got to be something good about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as you were discussing, it, it was really powerful that that idea that, you know, if we're asked what we would do, we have a week to live. It's often it'll be spend time with our loved ones. But for many of us, that's exactly what we've got. But I will add to that. We've got it, but maybe we're not prioritising it. We, we don't feel we're able to. So although we are with them, we're distracted. We think, oh, man, I, I, I really I need to be working. I should be doing this. So we're not actually being intentional. Like when I'm spending time with my children, let's say I'm not working. Let's say I'm not, you know, whether it's seeing patients or writing or doing a podcast or whatever it is I might be doing. Not to think of that as, oh man, I could be doing this, you know, like, oh man, I'm I'm not getting that done, but you know, I, I need to spend time mm -hmm. with the kids. And I'm like, hold on a minute, that is valuable time. That's not time where you're not working. That is the gold. Like, oh wow, I'm spending time with my kids now. Brilliant. Rather than I'm spending time with them, but in the background, work's going on. I know it's a subtle thing. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. really made a difference because then you don't feel you're mm -hmm. wasting time. I don't want to at all suggest that I feel time spent with my kids is wasting time. I don't. But sometimes mm -hmm. there's things, oh, I've got to get back to my work scene. I've got to get back to my work mm -hmm. scene. And then you're not fully present with what's actually going on. And I, for me, I've got to say that's, that's been, I don't think I'm over-egging it to say that's been life-changing. Yeah. No, I, I, I get what you mean. It's interesting. A funny little thing happened yesterday that really made me think about you know, that intention and what's going, what's running in the background um, about, you know, other things that you have to do is that, you know, I think it's sort of nine o'clock. So, you know, 9 p.m. almost at the end of the day, my husband said, I love you. So I said, I love you. And he said, no, you don't. And I said, why? And he went, you haven't said it to me today. And I don't even know if we do say it to each other every day, but I sort of thought, no, oh, I wasn't even aware of that. But then I realized it was important to him and that therefore that's really, really important. And this morning, you know, normally I just wake up when I wake up. But because I knew I was meeting you, I sort of asked him to bring me a cup of tea at a certain time in bed. And he came up to the room. And the first thing I said was, I love you, because I thought, you know, I don't want to feel like I've neglected 
something that's important to the most important person in the world to me. And it's such a tiny thing, but it doesn't take any effort for me to remember to say it. But it's important. And, you know, it's important in this strange time where who knows what emotions he was going through on that day, you know, like going back to the change curve. Yeah. Maybe he was having a, you know, a depression day and I didn't really notice. And so I think, you know, examining your important relationships, examining, are you really living the things that you say are important? Yeah. Now is the time to do it, 100%. It's, it's so interesting. Um, you know, again, awareness is coming up. It's that awareness of your own feelings, awareness of your partner's feelings, awareness of your children's feelings, whoever it is. And again, it comes back to what we were saying at the beginning. If you don't have a bit of time to yourself to journal or just to think, often we're not tapping into how we're feeling and therefore it's very hard for us to tap into how someone else is feeling. So because of these computers and emails, right? And our phones and the fact that we can now be contacted each day on WhatsApp and DM on Instagram and DM on Twitter and Facebook and text message and a phone call and whatever else, it, ah. <laughs> right? It, it can be so overwhelming. Mm. And, you know, you mentioned that chat with John McAvoy I had recently, the, the former prisoner who's now a really good friend of mine. And yes, so, so proud that National Prison Radio broadcasts that to 80,000 prison cells at the start of this week. So 80,000 prisoners listening to that conversation, <laughs> which is just wow. incredible. Yeah. But the, the big thing there was routine, right? And schedule, like how these guys, you know, how John got through solitary confinement. Well, just to be clear, for one whole year, he did not leave his prison cell for a year, right? <sighs> And that was partly him as well, because he refused to. He was almost having a, an act of rebellion against the system. But I said, how did you cope? He goes, routine. Routine. I needed a schedule. I'd get up. I'd do a workout. Every day. I said, John, did you ever feel a bit demotivated? Did you ever feel, oh, you know what? I'm not going to do it today. He said, yeah, sure I did. But I always did it because I remember how I felt afterwards. And that's what kept him sane. And you know, trying to bring it full circle again, those micro habits. If all you do when you wake up is for five minutes lie on your yoga mat or for five minutes do some breathing or five minutes do some journaling, that is a routine. Mm. That is you showing mm. yourself on a daily basis. That's what Mandela used to do to get him through. You know, he'd jog for 45 minutes on the spot in his prison cell, right? He didn't use the excuse of, I don't have the right running shoes. Uh, I don't have a treadmill. I can't go outside. Again, I say that with compassion. I don't say that. Yeah. I'm not at all talking down to people. I'm saying, look, there's a lot that we can do, no matter how challenging our circumstances are. Yeah, I mean, even if it's um, something like using meal times to create some structure in your day. So, um, like you, I think I, you know, I normally used to practice time restricted eating, so I wouldn't eat before twelve, and I'd finish eating by eight p.m. What I found in this lockdown is that. If I don't have that structure of the three meals a day and us sitting down together to have those meals, that's disruptive for me mentally and emotionally. So, you know, we started having the three meals a day. And then at one point I said, well, I think my husband said, actually, why don't we have like a later brunch and an earlier supper and just do two meals? That, that was at the time that it was very difficult to get, you know, grocery shopping and stuff. And we did that for one day. And I said, I can't do this. I need that structure of the three meals. And so... I'm, re I'm very curious to see what, you know, each of us will learn about ourselves from this process. Because one thing I learned earlier, which I'm seeing now, is that when I'm under stress, I become more OCD than I am normally. So, you know, everything has to be neat and tidy. Um, and now that we're doing the housework, it's, I said to my husband, I've discovered that you're not as neat and tidy as I thought you were. And he just said, darling, no one's as neat and tidy as you. And it just really made me realize that I'm probably being really OCD at the moment because when there's something outside that I can't control, I like to kind of like line everything up and have everything really neat and perfect. Um, but I was aware of that from before. So I thought, okay, that's happening, fine. Um, but I'm very, very curious to see what will I look back on? What will we each look back on from this period of time and say that, you know, it's it surfaced and it was a new thing that we learned about ourselves. And I would 
sort of follow on from that and say, for me, one of the other roles of journaling right now is to document that. So it may not be that you're journaling to um, get your anxieties and worries and your subconscious thoughts out to the paper, although, of course, that can be very valuable. It may also be that you're trying to journal each day. Oh, man, I've God, I've learned how much I love having three mealtimes each day with my family. Or I love the fact that I don't have to commute at the moment. So actually, I can go for a 30-minute walk every morning before I start my day. You know, I saw someone tweeted me the other day to say um, he just can't believe the difference it's made to his life and his productivity at work, even though he's working from home, when he goes for a half-hour walk each morning. I said, I never have time because I'm normally rushing around. I need to get the train and commuting. And he's thinking, well, how can I bring that into my life when this is all over? You know, and I think that's a very valuable question for us all to try and ask. What would we ideally like to bring into our lives when this is over? It doesn't mean we're going to be able to, you know, I get it. It may not, it may be easier for some than others. And yeah. Although we talked about vision boards last time, Tara, I, I, I think people really like that idea. And I, I wonder if we could just sort of, because, because I feel at the moment, if someone's doing that and thinking, oh, I like this, I like that, could they potentially use a vision board here to, you know, put their attention there and maybe increase the chances of that happening at some point in the future? That's actually such a good idea because... In a way, I was thinking, you know, the vision board that I created in January for 2020, there are simply some things on it that can't happen now. Um, You know, some of them can happen remotely. So, you know, um, I think I did say to you last time that doing a podcast with you was on my vision board last year. And, um, you know, getting to do one with you again is is, um, just so wonderful. And, you know, doing more podcasts was on my vision board because Uh. we, you know, changed it. Um, So I've sort of been saying to people, don't put too much pressure on yourself to you know, feel that you need to achieve the visions that you had at the start of the year or, you know, it may be difficult to create a vision board now. But I think you've just hit the nail on the head. The vision board could be how I want my life to be different, given what I've learned during lockdown. So I've actually been collecting images um, that I like, but they're all very colorful, very exotic. And I think it's sort of although I will never travel for work as much as I did ever again. That's a promise I've made to myself and I've said it in public now. You know, I sort of, I feel very, very lucky that I've traveled as much as I have for pleasure. There are a few places that I'd still like to go, but I think, you know, my heart and my spirit or whatever is like longing for these faraway places and these different foods and people that I might, you know, not get to experience again as much as I have in the past. Um, But I love this idea of using the, because, you know, I call it an action board because it has to be backed up by action of creating an image of the life that you would, you know, the the balanced life that you would want when things return to, you know, go go to however they're going to be and they're not like they are now. Because one of the things I worried about early on in lockdown is that it would be so easy to just get sucked back into being in that rat race, commuting, traveling, not spending you know quality time with your loved ones or not doing the walking in nature so I think a vision board is you know that's I'm going to do it after today and also I have to say to you that you said you were going to do a vision board after the last podcast and I haven't seen a picture of it that's a good point I I did actually start it but I don't think I finished it so I, I will tell you what what this morning what I was thinking about chatting to you and I have been thinking and and again it's that sort of accountability by because I knew I'd be talking to you. I was thinking, okay, Rangan, if you really do want to change certain aspects of your life afterwards, mm. and, and I'm always thinking at the moment, how can I combine what I do with my children and my wife? Because then we're doing something together. So then it's not either spend time with them or work or do personal growth. But you know, it's kind mm. of like, well, let's do something together. Mm. And then I sort of felt, well, maybe, you know at the weekend or they've got their half term coming up shortly, maybe the four of us together should try and create a vision board and, and, you know, they can do whatever they want, whatever their focus is. I would never want to put that onto them. But mine might be what kind of life do I want to live post lockdown? Um, Because I like you travel a lot. Now, I think I was very mindful of when I was back spending quality time 
undistracted time with my family. But yeah, I, I've realized that maybe I was traveling more than I ideally wanted. Yeah. So for people, Tara, because we have a lot more listeners now than we did when you first came on the show, which is fantastic. Like someone might be listening going, vision board, I'm skeptical, right, number one. And they might also be thinking, well, how do I actually do that? So although we did cover some of that last time, mm-hmm. I always think it, a, a little refresher on why a vision or an action board, why it can be helpful and how do you actually do it? Yeah, so um, the, the science behind why it's helpful is that we're bombarded with so much information all the time. So, you know, everything we read, everything we see, every person we interact with, and even our own emotions and memories. And so um, there are, there's a natural process in the brain to selectively filter um, what's important to our survival and, and selectively put attention onto what's important for us to thrive. And then there's also another system in the brain called value tagging, which puts those things in order of importance. And there's a, there's a logical element to that, you know, things I need to do today to, to live and work. And then there's an emotional element to that, which is, you know, the spending time with your family and having, you know, feeling comfortable with who you are and, you know, all that sort of thing that you've, you've already mentioned. And so if you create imagery that represents the things like how you want your life to be post lockdown, then you're more likely to notice and grasp opportunities to make that a reality. So that's all it is. It's not, you know, it's not as woo woo as some people, you know, the skeptics might think it is. It's literally priming your brain to remember what's important. Um, And so ideally it's a collage made by hand, although, you know, I've been getting a lot of DMs from people saying, well, I'm not getting magazines, (laughs) so how do I do it? And you can do it on Pinterest. There's an app called Corkulus, which is like a cork board. you know, there are ways on Google of just generating images of things. What, what exactly? Okay, so let, let's just break it down even further. So mm-hmm. what? You've got a collage. Okay, so you, you're, you've got a piece of paper or some card. Mm-hmm. And uh, what exactly are you wanting or suggesting that people put on it? Is it just images? Is it words? How many do you need? You know, I guess I'm asking semi for myself as well because I've forgotten from last time. <laughs> and I am going to do it this time and I am going to text it to you. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so I, I suggest that you don't use words or numbers. So it's it's visual imagery because that tracks to your subconscious more strongly. Um, also, it, ideally that it's metaphorical representations of what you want. So, you know, f- so a sort of... For travel, it could be, you know, just an image of a very exotic place that you like the look of. For you, it sounds like, you know, that very central on the board would be something to do with the four of you. Um, as, you know, as I, I said last time, if you want a life that's crammed full, then, the, the, you know, you should have as many images as you can on that piece of card. If you want some space in your life, then you, the images could be more separate with space between them. It's important which images are touching each other. So where you've said, let's do stuff together, you may find a way to combine work with, you know, with e- either with your wife or even with your children doing something with you, then you'd want those sections of the board to be near each other. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a whole chapter in the book on exactly how to do it, where to place it, how it works. Yeah. Um, but it is, you know, it's like those collages or scrapbooks that we used to make as children or, you know, or what people call mood boards, which is, Images that you're attracted to, images that represent something that you want. Um, I, I'm honestly going to redo mine based on what you said, which is which is about how I'd like my life to look after lockdown. Because I did have this feeling, I feel better about it now, but I did have this feeling that I don't 100% trust myself not to just go back to how things were before. Yeah. And I know that I don't want that, but I just also realise that it can be very easy for that to happen. I mean, what sort of came into my mind was... Um, when I'd been traveling in Nepal and, you know, just trekking for days and days and like, you know, sort of eating very simple food and, you know, being very immersed in that Buddhist and Hindu culture. And I remember I came back and I went into a shop and it was all about, you know, just indulge yourself, buy all these things. And I was quite horrified by it. But what I noticed was that two weeks later, that was completely normal to me. So, you know, we adapt quickly. Um, but I just think that having agency over that adaptation is really important. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a great point. It reminds me of, uh, I was chatting to a really good mate of mine, Jeremy, recently about 
what's it things going to be like afterwards? Um, you know, we're going to remember all this. And he says, and he, he, he loves reading history books. And he said, mate, listen, when all the history books I read seem to suggest that after things like pandemics or wars, people want to forget as, as quickly as possible and get back mm-hmm. to normal. Mm-hmm. And obviously for me, I, I knowingly don't really know, or I don't really have that experience. You know, I, I didn't live through the wars. Uh, I haven't been around during the time of a pandemic. So it feels so real at the moment. If I find it hard to believe that we'll forget this. But if we look at history to, to sort of learn some lessons, it looks as though we very much might do. And that's why I think writing down your thoughts at the moment, maybe if you're so inclined, you know, making an action board, some way of reminding you of some of these key lessons that you learnt and what you want to keep in your life afterwards, I think it's really important. Um, Yeah. I think it's also important to say, though, that, yeah, I I do believe that we've forgotten a lot of the lessons that people must have learnt during the wars and the aftermath of that. But if you think about the way that the role of women changed during the war. So, you know, the men went off to, to war and women took up jobs that traditionally weren't seen as jobs that women could do, like factory jobs or farming jobs. And so, you know, that changed forever. So, you know, there are some some things that have fundamentally changed and never gone back to how they were before. But, you know, you you talk about awareness and I talk about intention those two words are key here because if we don't set the intention and maintain our awareness we won't be choosing what changes fundamentally forever and and i think that really is key and again some people may go you know what i liked my life before i want to go back to that and i don't think any one of us is saying don't do that We're, we're simply saying be intentional with your choices. Understand that they are choices. I, I certainly hope for most people they're choices. I, I do appreciate that some people have to do things that they don't want to do or certainly feel as though that's their only option. But yeah. um, I think that's a really great lesson. Um, Tara, I want to I sort of finish off by a, something we, we hinted at a little bit before. And I think it's a topic that's worth exploring. And I've got to be honest, I wasn't that aware of it until I had a bit of a team meeting on Monday. Uh, with various members of my team, people who helped me with the podcast and various things. And, you know, we, we we were just doing this check-in, seeing how everyone's feeling, which is how we always start off. And there was a bit of anxiety. Now, that anxiety was around. You can remember Sunday night, as we're recording this conversation on, you know, five days ago, Sunday night, Boris Johnson made his yeah. speech in the UK mm-hmm. about how we may start to ease lockdown measures. And a lot of my team and, and all the people I spoke to have a bit of anxiety. They're like, oh, I've sort of got used to this new normal. The thought of going back to life at 90 miles an hour, it's actually causing a lot of anxiety and fear. And, you know, since, since my awareness got tuned into that because of what they said, it was really interesting that it's not quite related, but I've, as I say, I've been cycling a lot with the kids and my daughter's only seven, but I've been taking her on the road. So it's been like, there's hardly anyone on the road. So I'm trying to teach her and my son, you know, to the same degree about road safety and how you cycle on the roads. And this week, it has been noticeable how much busier the roads are, even though not that much mm-hmm. has changed. Yeah. Mentally, something has changed in society in terms yes. of what we feel you know, there is this idea, this this widespread belief now that lockdown sort of, now we're on lockdown light um, mm-hmm. compared to what it was anyway. And I was scared yesterday. I was like, oh man, I used to take them on these roads, but cars are going back, going by fast. Um, yeah. People are looking at their phones whilst they're driving. And I also thought, oh no, we're getting back to normal. Things are starting to seep back. So I know a lot of people listening to this will be feeling that. I wonder if you've got any advice for people who are feeling anxious about society returning back to normal and how they can cope with that. Yeah, it's a really good question. And I was asked a different version of that question maybe a month ago, which when it didn't look like it was easing, you know, people were like, how long are we going to have to stay like this? And I think that it's the perspective that you apply to it that can be really, really helpful here. So if you were thinking, 
is lockdown going to end next week? Is it going to be three weeks? When are the children going to go back to school? Is it going to be half term? Is it going to be, you know, summer holidays? That creates a lot of anxiety. If you set the goalpost a bit further, so if you tell yourself, I'm not going to think about this for a month, or I think things will only go back to normal in September or October, whatever you, know, whatever you think it is, but if you move the goalpost further, then you don't have to, you're not driven to feel as anxious because it's something that's further away. And what that produces is if you keep thinking, can I go back to normal next week? And then it doesn't happen. You know, and Boris says that's not going to happen. You'll get disappointed. If you put the goalpost further away, then it's likely that you're more likely that you'll be pleasantly surprised. So it is about giving yourself perspective. And I have a little exercise that I do when when I feel that I'm either getting into a rut or I'm starting to think about something very short term and it can build up some anxiety, is that I either look at the palm of my hand or I go outside and I look at a leaf or a flower very close up for um, a minute, which I time on my phone. And I look at every detail of it and you know I immerse myself in that for a minute. And then I will time the minute again and I'll look at a really big tree or a building far away in the distance. And I find it really helps my brain go from that short term anxious mode into the sort of bigger picture, you know, perspective about this whole situation. Um, so that's that's my little tip for that. I like that a lot. I love that. I've not heard that that sort of looking at something in the in very close to you like a leaf and then suddenly going to that big wide peripheral view. Uh, that's a really nice, there's a nice analogy there, isn't there? It's it's really, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to try that for sure. Um, what you said there actually reminds me of a chat I had just a few days ago. A really good friend of mine runs uh, a fitness business. Uh, I won't say too much, but she runs a fitness business and, um, you know, it's been going through some hard times and obviously has not been able to run classes mm -hmm. over the past however many weeks it has been now. And was actually saying to me that actually, you know what, I know I've needed a break for ages. And actually, this is in some way that's been really good, because mm -hmm. it's given me that break. Mm -hmm. um, but I keep sort of deferring, I keep saying to people who want me to do online classes, I just I just don't want to at the moment, I want to yeah. just rest. And I said, are you okay financially? She said, Yeah, I'm fine financially. I've, you know, my partner is able to work through this. And so we're okay. And she said, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer the decision. In a couple of weeks, I'll decide, or, or maybe in three weeks, I'll decide again. And I said, hey, you know what? If you really know you need this time and financially you're okay, what would the world look like if you said, you know what, I'm not going to restart till September. And then you're not constantly deferring that decision for two weeks. Yeah. So you, that stress is building. Oh, then it goes off. Stress is building. Then it eases off up again. Why not? you know, really take that opportunity to go, if you can, to go, yeah, you know what? I'm not working for the next two months. I'm yeah. going to recuperate. I'm going to enjoy my time, walk some nature. Um, and again, to really bring it back to something that happened in my life yesterday. Um, so my wife, she produces this podcast and she mm -hmm. works very, very hard on it. And yesterday, you know, she was homeschooling the kids a lot. She was, you know, she was, she was super busy and she was getting, you know, mid-afternoon, it was like, sort of frustration in some ways that she hadn't managed to get her work done mm -hmm. and it was building up there and I said hey babe listen you know it, it maybe just embrace the fact that actually you're not working today and actually you know that it's a day off and she goes yeah I should have done that but all morning and all afternoon I've been getting frustrated so yeah it, it's sometimes it's about and it, I know it's easy with hindsight but it's sometimes better to go hey you know what I'm having today off and embrace the fact and don't constantly think about your emails or your workload. It's, you know, I'm, I'm hoping those two stories I shared there may be of some value to somebody listening to this right now. Yeah, because actually, you know, often we say, oh, well, the benefit of hindsight, it's too late kind of thing. But actually, at the moment, it's not too late because you can have that day off. You can yeah. defer something. I mean, I think your friend in the fitness industry, if they say, OK, I'm not going to work till September, if they change their mind in the meantime, great, fine. But if they don't, they've given themselves permission. Um, and, you know, like we've said repeatedly throughout this, you know, if in whichever way you're privileged to make certain choices, now's the time to make them. And even if it's you do it a day, a day too late because it's hindsight, but you can still do it. You know, I have one of my favorite phrases is 
the best time to plant an oak tree was 200 years ago. The second best time is today. Says it already, doesn't it? Tara, oh man, I, I really love talking to you. Um, I, I, I really do. I think this could go on for a long time. I would much <laughs> rather we did it face to face and we will mm -hmm. do another one yeah. face to face for sure. And I will do that vision board, right? That's a proper promise this time, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, but as you remember from last time, I always like to finish with actionable tips for people. Now, mm -hmm. I will say to people listening and watching this that Tara's book, The Source, is fantastic. It's full of science. It's very easy to read. A lot of practical tips in it. So I really would encourage people to take a look at The Source um, so they can learn more about your philosophy and your, your practical tips. But for the purpose of this podcast, for people listening who like what they've heard today and feel inspired mm. to make change, I always like to leave people with a few practical tips that they can think about applying into their own life immediately. So Tara, I wonder if you could share some of your top tips. Okay, so I'm going to give um, two tips that aren't in the book. One is um, about reviewing the past and one is um, about being in the present and, you know, enjoying yourself for the future. So... One of the things I speak about is entrenched neural pathways, which are ways of being that are habits and behavior patterns for us because they've been there for so long. This is a really interesting time to explore some of those. So I'm talking about things like uh, from childhood, things like the role that you play in the family, the beliefs that are you know held within your family, the value system. And a really interesting one at the moment is boundaries, because, you know, some people um, have quite strong boundaries anyway. They may be introverted. They may, you know, sort of not really have that many people coming to their house. Some people may be the kind of family that always had people coming over, sleeping on the sofa. So to really sit down and think, you know, what role did I play as a child that can be playing out now? What do I strongly believe or uphold as a value that can either be helping or hindering me now in this lockdown situation? And, and to really understand your boundaries, because that's going to help with the vision boards that people make for how they want life to be after lockdown, you will need to uphold your boundaries around some things because there's gonna be a lot of external pressure and changes. So I think those are really important things to reflect on. And then I do want to offer an exercise for the people that you mentioned, the, you know, the frontline workers, the people who are sort of run ragged with stress, and, but it's for everyone, but it's, I did want to end with you know, really like offering something to those people and it's, it's what I call body gratitude. So you can do it in the shower or you can do it if you're moisturizing your skin. And you go from head to toe and you thank each different part of your body for what it's doing. So your lungs for breathing for you, your skin for protecting you, for maintaining your physical boundary. Um, you know, a lot of women are struggling with what to do with their hair at the moment. But thank your hair for being in the condition that it's in. Um, so you just basically go through your whole body outside and inside and you literally thank each part. You know, maybe that hamstring that's playing up. You thank it for giving you information about the condition of the muscles and joints and tendons in your body. Um, and it's just it's a really, really feel good exercise um, because, you know, when we're stressed, we you know, there's this systemic dryness. It's a really good idea to get the benefits of moisturizing and the gratitude um, all in one. So I really hope people try it because you feel like a million dollars afterwards, you know, even if your hair is not doing what you'd like it to at the moment and you can't do much about it, you, it makes you feel amazing. So I think that's how I'd like people to feel at the end of this. I really like that, Tara. How, and, and just for people who think they may not have time for that, it sounds like that's an exercise that doesn't need to take very long at all. Not at all. And, you know, you can do it in the shower. Um, and I mean, it can take one to two minutes, but also you can build it up over time. So, you know, you can start it today and then add to it tomorrow and um, just do it every so often. Yeah, fantastic. Well, Tara, thank you so much for making time today. Um, you know, I hope you make a, an amazing action board. I hope it actually brings into your life what you want it to at the end of this. And I look forward to the next time we have a conversation on the podcast. Me too. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast again. Press subscribe to get more inspiration and ideas on how to feel better so you can get more out of life. And if you have a moment, why not check out this conversation that I've picked out as a perfect follow-up. Remember, lifestyle change is always worth it because when you feel better, you live more.